We are in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 13 this morning. And today we're going to be talking about growth through uh, discipline. Now, you may be looking at Hebrews chapter 12 and you may be thinking, wait a minute, we talked about this not too long ago. This is a repeat. And um, you know what? You're, you're, you're kind of right. <laughs> As I was, you know, thinking about things and praying about things and kind of planning out uh, our little mini-series on Christian growth, um, I kept on coming back to, to grow through discipline, how we need to talk about the Lord's uh, growth or, or Lord's discipline in our lives in order to have growth. And, um, you know, I, I kept on thinking, okay, what passage does that? And I kept on coming to this passage, and I kept on thinking, well, we've already talked about this passage. It wasn't just a couple of months ago before we talked about this, at least a little bit. And so, you know, I kept on thinking, what, but, you know, my mind kept on going back to that. So, yes, it is a little bit of um, a repeat, but at the same time, uh, it's important for us to kind of look at this and, and kind of see some things about how the Lord is going to be using discipline in order for us to, uh, you know, have growth. Okay, so uh, kind of give you a little bit of quick review about what we've been looking at last couple of weeks. Last couple of weeks, we looked at how we had growth through the Word of God and how through the Word of God, we have uh, an increased knowledge about what God's will is. And that isn't to say that Christian growth is an intellectual exercise, but we do need to know some things about God. We do need to know some things about His Word in order to grow and mature as Christians. And also we looked at the fact that we have trials, and God gives and allows trials in our lives in order for us to have a better understanding about who He is, a uh, better understanding about how to apply certain things uh, in life, and about uh, a, a better understanding about how to just simply believe in Him and trust in Him. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at discipline, and we're going to be seeing how God uses discipline in order for us to grow as Christians. There are times in our lives that we have a tendency to not just simply stagnate, but even sometimes that we have a tendency to, to backslide a little bit. And so God uses discipline in order for us to continue to go and to continue to grow as Christians. And so um, very similar to what we looked at last week, we're going to be looking at what is the Lord's discipline. Uh, we're going to be looking at what does discipline do for us. And then last but not least, we're going to be looking at um, what we need to do uh, when we are disciplined, okay? So, starting out, let's take a look exactly what is the Lord's discipline. Now, when somebody talks about God's discipline and God's disciplining His children, I think that a common thought that goes through people's minds is that God is punishing us for sin. You know, we're doing something that God doesn't like, and so because God doesn't like it, then therefore He's going to discipline us uh, to get us to be, I guess you could say, uncomfortable enough to switch courses and, and go from this course of, of action in our lives to a different course of action in our lives. And so it's very easy for us to, you know, think about, you know, somebody who is completely backslidden, somebody who's dropped out of church, somebody who's, uh, you know, just engaging in the world sins, all these things that God is going to uh, practically bring the plagues of Egypt down upon them to get them to uh, switch courses and to get them back into church or to get them away from the world sins or whatever the case may be. And a lot of times that's where our minds go to when we think about the Lord's discipline, right? But I want you to kind of think about it in a different regard, in a different idea. I mean, yes, that is true. If, if we start to uh, skip out of church or if we start to engage in the Lord's uh, uh, world sins, that the Lord does discipline us. And sometimes that discipline can be very heavy handed. And sometimes it can feel like the Lord is punishing us for it. But really, when you think about discipline, discipline just isn't about punishment. As a matter of fact, when you take a look at verse number seven, where it says, endure hardship as discipline, God is treating you as sons. Uh, understand that this is, um, when we talk about discipline, 
What we're really talking about is child training. As a matter of fact, this word discipline means child training. If we we're to translate it literally, it would be child training. And so you think, okay, well, as a child is trained, um, you know, what are some things that a parent would use? I mean, sometimes, they, yeah, when a, a child is really getting out of hand and really rebellious, um, maybe there does need to be somewhat of a heavy-handed approach to it. I can remember uh, quite vividly when I was growing up, there were some times that, uh, you know, my dad uh, really was heavy-handed on me, quite literally. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't very fun at the time, but that was part of it. But I can remember some other things as well. And, and looking back on my children, disciplining my children, you know, it wasn't just simply a one-time or one-trick pony type of thing. You know, Jan and I used all kinds of different methods in order to discipline or rear or uh, train our children. And so when you think about God's discipline of us, don't just simply think about that one heavy-handed approach. Instead, think about all the different things that God does to train us as being His children, okay? And when you look at verse number 7, you see that it says this, it says in verse number 7, Endure hardship is discipline. God is treating you as sons. And so God, when He is undergoing and He's trying to mold and shape our lives, uh, sometimes when we're rebelling against it, you know, God is trying to treat us as a father would a child or as parents would a child. Uh, he's trying to, to uh, um, mold us and shape us and, and uh, you know, kind of get us to doing what He wants and getting us to see certain things in our life. Now, notice it says there in verse number 7, God deals with us. This is something that God does. It's not something that, you know, um, we do. It's not something that, that, that we say, okay, I'm going to do this, but it's something that God does. And when you think about um, uh, Christian growth, Christian growth really is something that God does for us, right? So when we think about uh, God's discipline in our lives, and if we, if we view this solely as just simply God punishing us for sin, then we're really kind of on the wrong track of things automatically. Because when you think about it, um, don't we always sin? Okay, so if we always sin, then does God always punish us? No, he, he doesn't, as a matter of fact. You know, when we think about God, God is rich in mercy. And when we think about the fact that we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, then we have been forgiven of our sins. And so when we have all of these things that come into our lives that are disciplined, if we view it as far as God is punishing me for my sin, then we're already on the wrong track because understand that God, uh, God's punishment for sin is uh, death and hell. And so uh, we escape death and hell because of Jesus Christ and because of the mercy that comes from the Father. And so this discipline that we have is not a substitution of that. It's not like, okay, we've got to have our hell now so we don't experience it later. No, that's not true at all. Instead, what this is, is not punishment of sins. It's really just simply God trying to get our attention so that we can continue to go and undergo the same paths that He wants from us. And it is God disciplining us or God dealing with us as children. Now, if you stop and think about it, especially when we read there in verse number 7, where it says, endure hardship as discipline, um, that's something that's very similar to what we talked about last week with trials, isn't it? You know, we talked about last week about how we have all of these different diverse trials, all these various trials of our faith that come upon us, and it's all kinds of different stuff, isn't it? It is just simply, you know, sometimes we may have questions about things. Sometimes we have situations and circumstances. Sometimes it may be persecution. Sometimes it may be all kinds of different things. But all of those different things are a trial of our faith. And they're all hard. They're all difficult. Okay? And so here we've got hardships. And it's really very similar. As a matter of fact, it could be that a, a, a disciplinary action of the Lord is a trial that we have to undergo. It's something that we have to, to work our way through so that we can experience some of the things that He wants for us. Um, but when we think about the Lord's working in our life 
you know, it's very similar to uh, trials, but at the same time, if we want to make a difference and denote a distinction in between them, we need to understand is that there is a difference of why they're there. Trials, as far as just simply in and of themselves, are there so that we can grow and develop and mature. Discipline is there is because we're really starting to go on a wrong course of action and we need to be brought back, okay? And so with trials, maybe we're here and God wants us to be here, but with discipline, maybe we're here and we're going down this way and God wants us to reverse course. Or it could be that maybe we are at this level right here and God wants us here and we're stuck here and we're very stubbornly refusing to go up to the next level, okay? And so discipline is very similar to trials, but maybe it's God working a little bit more and a little bit more involved to get us to go in a certain direction, okay? So one thing that it's not is it's not punishment of sin. One thing that it is is God disciplining us and treating us as sons. And so what does discipline do for us, especially in regards to our Christian growth? Okay, all right, well, when we look at verse number 9 through verse number 11, we see three different things that the Lord's discipline is going to bring. If you look at verse number 9, you see that it says this, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Okay, so one thing that we see that discipline brings for us is it brings life. Okay. Now, if you think about life and you think about the opposite of life, well, the opposite of life is what? Well, it's death, right? Okay. Why do we experience death? Well, we experience death because of sin. The penalty of sin is death. And sometimes when we think about um, death, you know, we could say that there are sometimes fates worse than death. Um, sometimes the things that we go through in life, even though it isn't physical death, it is just simply um, um, something that is, is very bad and very wrong. And when we think about sin, sin is going away from God. And so going away from God, we are going towards the realm of death and we're going towards the realm of bad things. And so if you think about it, one thing that discipline is going to do is it is going to steer us back towards God. And since God is the author of life, it's going to steer us back into being in a right relationship with God, and it's going to steer us back into life. Not just simply life as far as a vital spiritual life, <clears throat> but life in terms of sometimes a physical life too. You know, we oftentimes think of sin as just simply something that God doesn't want for our lives. And that's true. That's exactly what sin is. Sin is something that is against God's will. But have we ever a little, taken a little bit of a step further to think, well, wait a minute, why doesn't God want us to sin? You know, God doesn't want us to sin because it violates Him and it violates His character and His, His nature, right? But at the same time, um, God doesn't want us to sin because it is harmful to ourselves. You know, we don't oftentimes think about it that way. But one reason why God doesn't want us to sin is because it hurts us. And we think, well, wait a minute. I, you know, I, here I am, I'm engaged in this sin, and I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't see any harm that's bringing to me. I don't see any harm that's bringing to somebody else. But we don't have the ability to look at the bigger picture that God does, and we certainly don't have the ability to look into the future. You know, one thing that sin does is it may not bring the harm to our lives immediately, but it may bring the harm to our lives later on, okay? Just like kids, you know, sometimes kids can only see the, the world in front of them. They can't see what things are going to be like, you know, a little bit around the corner or much less, you know, a year or two or something there. And so that's where parents are involved. Parents say, no, don't do that. The kid may say, well, I don't understand why I can't do that. Because after all, it, it's fun, it's exciting, and, 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 and it, you know, there's no harm in it. <clears throat> but as a parent, you know, well, wait a minute, you know, it, it may not be a harm right now, but it may be a harm around the corner. It may be a harm a year from now, two years from now, something like that. And so God has the ability to see everything, right? And so we need to submit to God's discipline and in submitting to God's discipline, then we can have life. 
And sometimes, um, if we don't, it can literally lead to our physical death, you know? I mean, for example, um, you know, drunkenness is something that God tells us not to do. And some people say, well, I don't see a problem with it. I mean, if I'm not hurting anybody, I'm not hurting anybody. But then again, you know, prolonged use of, of alcohol can lead to alcoholism. It can lead to psoriasis of the liver. It can lead to all these other problems. And so you see, that's the idea that God is taking us, okay? So that's one thing that discipline does for us. Another thing that discipline does for us is this. If you look at verse number 10, it says, Our fathers thought, uh, excuse me, our fathers disciplined for us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. You know, something else that discipline brings for us is for our good. Oftentimes we get it within our minds that evil and sin is something that um, is good. And that's the reason why we want to do it is because we think it's good. But what we need to understand is that God's will is what is really good. And so we need to do it. And God disciplines us to get us into His will for good. Okay? And if you notice there, it says this at the end. It disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. And so here is God's holiness. And by disciplining us and by getting us to do what God wants us to do, then really what's going on is that we are sharing in His holiness. Now, the word holy has the same sort of meaning and the same sort of derivation as the word sanctification. It's really talking about the same thing, and that is being set apart. And so when you think about holiness, you're really saying set apart for God, set apart for Him, set apart for His use and service. And when you think about holiness, that's exactly what it is. And that is, it's taking our lives and it's being set apart for God, His use, and His, His righteousness, His what He wants for us to do. And so when you think about it in that regard, there, there can't be anything better than that, right? I mean, we're not talking about just simply something here now. We're talking about something that has eternal purposes and eternal long-lasting things. And so discipline is there, so it is for our good, and our good, really God's good is what is our good, and we can share in His holiness. Now, here's the third thing, and that is looking at verse number 11. Notice what it produces. In verse number 11, it says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace, for those who have been trained by it. Now, here it is spring, and um, a lot of farmers are going to at least getting in their crops right now or thinking about getting in their crops. And so, you know, you may be driving along by a farm field and you might look at a field and you might see little sprouts that are poking up through the ground. I know that I'm, as I'm driving to church, there is one little, you know, Fallon's a pretty interesting area, isn't it? You know, you've got housing developments and everything, and then you've got a farm <laughs> sitting right there. So as I'm driving, here's this farm, and I've noticed that they plowed the field and they planted their crops, and now I'm noticing little sprouts, you know, popping up in all of their, their rows, okay? Now, as the course of time goes on, it's going to grow to something else, and I don't know exactly what they planted, but based on past years, it's probably corn. Okay, and so, you know, the corn stalks are going to grow and then pretty soon the ears of corn are developed and then, you know, the corn stalks are going to be dry and then there's going to be the harvest time. And it takes a while for all of this to happen. It's not that we're going to, you know, I'm going to leave from church and go home and see you, you know. It's going to take a while. And at the same time, notice what happens when we submit to the Lord's discipline. That is, right now, it's not a whole lot of fun. It's, it's pretty painful. But later on, it's going to produce a harvest of righteousness. And so in, instead of growing ears of corn, what we're going to be doing is we are going to be growing righteousness in our lives. And if you think about it, if God's direction is to point us further into knowing and understanding and doing His will, and the fact that we are doing what His will is, then our lives are going to be filled with more and more righteousness. Now, it may take a little bit. 
It may take some time for us to come around. It may take us uh, some time to go through the hardship and go through the trouble. But eventually what's going to happen is we are going to start to see the, the benefits of it. We're going to start to reap the reward, and the reward is going to be righteousness. Now you say, okay, well, is that good? Is that going to be something that's, that's uh, good for our lives? Well, yeah, it is. I mean, take a look at what else it says. It says it's a right, harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And you know, that's what righteousness does, is righteousness produces peace. Now, what does unrighteousness produce? Well, immediately, unrighteousness produces fun, it produces excitement, it produces all of those things. But if it continues, it starts to go on and produce other things too. And once we start to reap the consequences of those actions, then all of a sudden the fun's gone, the excitement's gone, and we're left with the pain, we're left with the misery of it, and we're left with the unpeace of it all. But at the same time, if we go back the other way, instead of going towards sin, if we start to go towards righteousness, then all of a sudden we start to see the benefits of it. We start to see and understand how our lives are in the center of God's will. We start to have the joy of the Lord. We start to have the, the peace and the love that comes from the Holy Spirit. And so once we've been trained by what the Lord is trying to get us to do, then we can have these things, right? So you say, okay, well, we've got good, we've got um, uh, holiness, we've got life, we've got righteousness. Um, those really sound very familiar to the things that we've been talking about the last three weeks. Hopefully it does. And that is, since we've been talking about uh, some things, we start to see a little bit about what Christian growth is. Christian growth, as we've been looking at, is not just simply one thing. I mean, it's kind of like a multitude of different things, but all of it is the fact that we should be growing and we should be developing and maturing in our Christian lives. It means that we start to become less like us and we start to become more like Christ. And when I say that, it's not that we're losing our personality or who we are, but we're starting to become less like us as far as sinners go. We're supposed to be becoming more like Christ. And incidentally, um, we're not called to be anybody else other than to be like Christ. You don't need to be like me. You need to be like Christ, right? And I don't need to be like anybody else. I need to be like Christ. And when Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, he wasn't just simply saying, follow me. He's saying, follow me as I follow Christ. And so the whole thing is that we become more and more uh, molded in shape around the image of God's dear beloved son. And that's really what Christian growth is all about. And so when we think about furthering our lives into God's will, furthering our lives into being molded and shaped um, by um, 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 events and circumstances and, and who we are, molded and shaped so we can better understand God's will, then that is how we can look and say, hey, I see that discipline really does cause us to grow. Now, when you think about some of the things that we've looked at, and that is that uh, we've got growth through the Word of God, knowledge of the Word of God, uh, we can stop and think, well, okay, you know, furthering into God's will, we need to know God's will. And so we do grow as Christians when we start to have an increase of our knowledge of the Scriptures, our knowledge and understanding of who God is and what He wants. So, so we can further our way into God's will with that. But at the same time, it's not just simply about knowing, it's about depending, it's about understanding. And so we've got tests that come into our lives, trials that come into our lives, so that we can further understand all of these things, right? Okay, well now we've got discipline, and discipline is there to kind of correct us and shape us back to the area. And I, I, when I think about this, I think about dogs, okay? Now, I don't think about cats. I think about dogs because you can't really discipline a cat, but you can discipline a dog. <laughs> you know, you can train a dog into understanding your will uh, a whole lot more than you can cats. I don't even know if you can do that with cats. Uh, you can. Okay. Well, you can. I don't know. I've never had a cat. I just, you know, it's going to be hard. But, you know, with dogs, on the other hand, you know, that's why they're man's best friend. <laughs> okay. 
So I think about my um, three dogs. Olga remembers my three dogs. Marianne, you might remember my three dogs, but you know, a long time ago, I had Black Lab named Toby, and then we had the Weird Lab named Chaser, and then of course, my Chocolate Lab Twix now, right? Okay, and so Toby, Chaser, and Twix are a whole lot like all of these things, okay? So Twix, you know, when I'm trying to train Twix, Twix is a great dog. You know, she'll just look at me like I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to understand what you want. What do you want me to do? Okay. I mean, she really has that look on her face. When, you, when She'll make eye contact with you. She's trying to figure it out. Now, uh, you know, I'm having a hard time communicating with her because I'm a person, she's a dog. But I'm doing my best. And when I can get that, when she understands it, she gets it, you know. And because she's got a, a really good nature about her, she'll usually do it, all right? Now, Chaser, on the other hand, the Chaser, you try to talk to him, and he'll just blank. <laughs> you know, you try to train him, blank. Okay, it's like, oh boy, we got, we got more work to do with you, Chaser, all right? You know, maybe we need a little bit more training with things. You know, just simply learning it's not enough. We gotta, and then there's Toby. Toby was, you know, really good with understanding. He was really smart about things, and he was really obedient about things to a point. <laughs> there were times that Toby got it within his mind of, yeah, you want me to do this, but I want to do that over there, and yeah, I'm just going to go over here and do it, you know? Okay, so sometimes... God treats us like Twix, you know, just trying to get his will across to us. And it's difficult, okay? It's difficult because we aren't on the same level as God. We're not on the same plane as God, okay? And there are some times that we're like Chaser. We just don't get it at all. And God has to put us in situations and circumstances in our lives in so that we'll know it. And then there's times that we're like Toby, where we want to do one thing, even though we know we should do something different, okay? But they're all leading to the same thing, and that is a better understanding and adherence to what God's will is. So, what should we do when we're disciplined? Okay, take a look at verse number 12. In verse number 12, it says this, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Okay, one thing that we need to understand is that we need to have a certain amount of strength. When we are undergoing God's discipline, as what we said before, it is something that in verse number 11, it says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. And it deed it does. <laughs> okay. When God is disciplining us, it is never a fun time. It is something that we um, are, it's a, it's a hardship that we have to undergo. Sometimes we think, you know, the Lord is not loving us. The Lord is not wanting us. It is, uh, you know, it, it's tough, okay? So what we need to do is um, we need to strengthen our lives. We need to strengthen what it says, our feeble arms. You know, there's sometimes that, you know, you're just going and you're going and you're going, you're working, you're playing and, and you know, you just, you just get tired and sometimes it just feels like your arms aren't even going to be able to pick anything up, you know. Well, that's when you got to reach down deep and you got to continue on. And sometimes when we are going in our life and the Lord is disciplining us, and working on us, and we start to, to feel like David. David in Psalm 32, uh, when he was being disciplined by the Lord, kind of felt like that his um, bones were just uh, decayed all the way through, and that he, he um, 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 had groanings on his body. Um, sometimes we feel like that. And sometimes we just want to quit and give up, but that's what we don't need to do. Instead, we need to give in to God. Maybe we need to quit and give up to our old life, but I mean, you know, when we make the switch, that's when we need to have strength. And so you notice in verse number seven where he says, endure hardship is discipline. It's just like with the trials last week, isn't it? Last week when we were talking about trials, trials there are meant to be there to give us endurance, and we need to allow endurance to have that perfect work. 
so that we may be perfect and complete. And so here we need to look at this and say, okay, we've got this hardship in our lives. Why is this hardship here? This hardship is here, not because God doesn't love us or God doesn't want us. It's here because God does love us and God does want us to do what He wants us to do. And so what we need to do is we need to endure that and continue through that. And we may feel weak and we may feel out of strength and we may feel just completely zapped. But that's when the time that we need to reach out. We need to have a little bit of, of inward strength that God gives us. And maybe we need to pray for strength. So may, we may strengthen our feeble arms and weak knees. Now, here's something else. And that is that it says in verse number 13, make level paths for your feet. Okay. Now, frequently when you read in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Proverbs, it's talking about making straight paths, making level paths. And maybe we don't quite understand that, but, you know, if we were in a car on a nice smooth highway all the time, uh, instead if we were on foot, you know, going up and down footpaths, maybe we would understand it better. You know, when you're on a footpath, it would be a whole lot better, especially if you're walking a long distance, to have a nice, smooth, fairly level path to walk on rather than to just simply climb up hills and climb over rocks and wade through creeks and everything like that. You know, when you're wading through creeks, climbing over rocks, going up hills, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, it's tough, but also it's kind of treacherous occasionally. You know, when you're doing that, it could be that you step on a rock and when you step on a rock wrong, it rolls and your ankle rolls and then you've really got a problem especially if you've already got an injury to begin with, right? And so he says, make level paths for your feet that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Now, all this in the Old Testament about making straight paths are really the idea that what we need to do, just like you would make a level path for you to walk down in life, Making level paths in our Christian lives, our spiritual lives, really means that we're going to be doing the things that would be walking with the Lord. We're going to be going along paths of righteousness. We're going to be going along paths that God wants us to go down. And so instead of the ups and the downs and the twists and the turns and the, the, the crevices and the rocks and everything of life and the life of sin, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going down what God wants us to do. And people will say, well, that doesn't look like it's any fun. Instead, climbing up this hill and going over that big rock, that looks fun. But we know if we do that, we might wind up getting hurt. And especially if we've been hurt before, it may be even worse to begin with. And so what we need to do is if we are undergoing discipline and we're experiencing all these hardships of the Lord because of something that we're doing or something that we're not doing, what we need to do is, first of all, hey, let's, let's endure through the hardship. But secondly, what we need to do is just simply make straight paths. Make level paths. All the things that are in our lives can be put back together. And those injured uh, limbs may be healed. Notice what he says there in verse number 9. He says there, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Lord's discipline and live submitting to God's discipline, submitting to the Father of our spirits. That's what we need to do is just simply say, you know what? The reason why these things are in my life right now is because God wants me to do something different. And I don't need to be stubborn or rebellious. What I need to do is I need to just simply do what God wants me to do and make a commitment to it. And when we do that, we start to make that level path and it may be difficult, it may be treacherous, it may take a while, but we need to endure through that so that we can get through the end. Now, you see what God does when He uses uh, discipline in our lives, especially in regards to Christian growth. It is something there that God puts in our lives because He loves us, and it's there something because God wants us to go from one level of our Christian life to another level of our Christian life. It's very similar to all the other things of growth, but it's something that God wants. Okay, so question is, are we being disciplined? When we look at our lives right now, and we look at the hardships in our lives, 
are the hardships there just simply because it's life? Well, you know, it is. I mean, that's life is hard, like it or not. Sometimes it's harder than other times, but, you know, life in itself is just simply hard. But why is it hard? Is, is it something that God is doing in our lives? Is it something that God is trying to get us to grow and develop spiritually or not? And is it something that God is trying to get us away from or get us to move out of that stubbornness or not? If we start to look at our lives and we start to say, yeah, you know what? I've been doing something in my life that God doesn't want. I've been persistent about it. I've been stubborn about it. You know, it could be that the discipline that we're undergoing, the hardship that we're going, is discipline to get us in a certain way. And if that's the case, then let's look at verse number 12. Let's look at verse number 13. Let's endure through things. Let's submit. Okay? Now, I've been talking all this about Christians and how Christians need to grow. But um, in order to have this growth to begin with, you've got to be a child of God. And to be a child of God, you have to come by faith to Jesus Christ. And so if you're here in the room or if you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube, if you know in your heart that you're a sinner and you know in your heart that Jesus Christ died for you, then just simply give in to what God has done for you. Um, God has produced, God has provided, excuse me, uh, salvation for every single person. There isn't a person on this earth that can't be forgiven of their sins and experience eternal life with God if they would just simply recognize and realize that God is um, providing, has provided salvation for us through Jesus Christ. And if everybody realizes, hey, you know what, I'm a, I'm a sinner, and Jesus Christ was God's means of providing salvation for me. If we believe that in our hearts and we go to Him and we confess it before Him, then we are saved. And so today, if you don't know that, if you don't believe that, if you've never trusted in that, I hope that you will trust in that. I hope that you will confess your sin, repent of your sin to God, and that you will become a child of God. And then from there, then we've got Christian growth. Okay? Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for everything you've given us. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this day, and we thank you for the, uh, the wisdom and the guidance that you provide for us. Lord, I ask that you please take this word, apply it to each and every one of our hearts. And Lord, we ask that you be at the lost, wherever they may be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.